Okay, um, welcome everybody to the uh, lunch hour lecture here at UCL today. My name is Ivan Parkin. I'm Dean of Mathematical and Physical Sciences here at UCL. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Than Neugen, who's going to give the talk today. She's also going to do a few demonstrations, so we're keeping our fingers crossed that they all work. Very brave. Um, Professor Neugen um, actually has uh, five, sorry, no, four, she's a member of four learned academic bodies, a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry, fellow of the Institute of Materials, Mining and Metallurgy, fellow of the Institute of Physics, and also very recently, a fellow of the Royal Society of Biology, um, which means she has quite a lot of subscriptions to pay. Um, she was appointed a full professor in nanomaterials here in 2013 in the biophysics group from the Department of Physics at UCL. She leads a very dynamic group conducting cutting edge interdisciplinary and innovative research on the design, synthesis of magnetic and plasmonic nanomaterials for biomedical applications. And I think that's what some of the demonstrations will, will be about. She's published over 100 peer-reviewed journal articles, theme issues, and book chapters with over 6,000 citations, and nine papers with over 100 citations, and one which has over 1,500, which is more than me, actually. So well done. Um, she has also been invited to speak at 240 institutes and scientific meetings, and she's also chair or been on the organizing committee of, very, of 40 high-profile international conferences. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Than for the lecture. Thank you very much. I got my. Can you hear me on the back? Thank you very much for coming uh, for the lunch hour lecture. So you know about the title of my talk already. It's about nanomaterial tackling the global challenge. So um, there are many global challenges, but today I'm to focus on one global challenge that is health. So. Um, this now celebrate 10 years I'm at UCL. Also that 10 year I'm at the Ron Institution. So Ron Institution, as some of you know, that they hold the very uh, famous Christmas lecture and one of the oldest scientific research laboratory in the world. And there is a joke, the joke that uh, the highest concentration of Nobel laureate per meter square there. And uh, as there, they also discovered 10 elements, and we know about Michael Faraday. Um, if you study um, physics, then you know, he discovered the connection between electricity and magnetism. So that gives you a little bit about the history of the place. So um, Humphrey uh, Davey, he discovered nine elements at the Ron Institution. And today, I got a lot to, about, to talk about the Michael Faraday. And John Tyndall, um, it's just like one of um, the effects named after him. It's a tinder effect. So if you have um, some light scattering through, then you will see. Um, I can do that in so here that you can see that light scattering. So that is a tinder effect of the scattering of the of colloidal um, particle in the solution. So then James Dewa, and if you go to the Royal Institution and you look into the foyer, there are lots of different Dewa, um, the device to keep something warm and, um, and also cold. And then um, we have um, here's two father and son, the Braggs. And then we work with nanoparticle, we do the um, X-ray diffraction, so obviously that's really very relevant to us. And um, so we, um, Quentin Pankhurst and I, uh, we start working at Ron Institution in um, 2008. He started first. I came to UCL in January 2009, so now it's 10 years we have been there. So um, in 2010, to celebrate 350 years of the Ron Society, uh, I said, well, it's a really nice year to do. So I edited a nanoparticle team issue. And then five years later, in 2015, the Ron Society um, commissioned a series of the Ron Society uh, science story and to celebrate 350 year um, publication of the Ron Society. To 
we work a lot more with the magnetic nanoparticle because with a magnetic nanoparticle one of the property is that when you use the alternating magnetic field and the spin when going up and down and there are two phenomena happen you will have a particle tumbling around by doing so in hitting the nanoparticle locally so you can induce the heat locally if the particle happened to be in the cancer cell or tumor so you can kill the cancer cell uh, locally so instead of using the chemotherapy where you're going to have a side effect because the drug can go everywhere in the body and it's going to have a side effect into the healthy tissue as well but you can also design the particle to have a function or they have a specific targeting that when this nanoparticle um, it you can like home in or direct into the certain organ to do the certain thing you want them to do so it's kind of a charging horse that you can also put in the nanoparticle with the drug so it can combine the drug with the nanoparticle so we now uh, one of the strand of the research we use a thermal and chemotherapy combined so using heat to killing the cancer cell at the same time that we can also encapsulate the anti-cancer drug so we have a two synergistic effect and then you're going to reduce both the concentration of nanoparticle and also concentration of the um, toxic anti-cancer drug when did nanotechnology start Michael Friday actually already made the go nanoparticle in 1856 and he called it ruby fluid and as we know now it's a go colloidal solution and I'm very lucky and privileged that uh, our lab is based at Stroud Institution and so I'm going to speak to Professor Frank Jim, an expert about Michael Friday. Frank, where are we now? We're in the basement laboratory of the Royal Institution, which Michael Faraday used in the middle third of the 19th century. He had two laboratories, this one here and one there outside the corridor that was demolished uh, in the uh, 1870s. So in this laboratory uh, in 1845 that Faraday discovered the Faraday effect, many optical effect, and diamagnetism. Uh, and it's almost certainly the laboratory uh, where he did his work on colloidal sources of gold. Uh, in 1856 because he had to have a, a dark space and this is actually a fairly dark space down here uh, in the basement. So this is Faraday, this is the beginning of Faraday recording this very long series of experiments that he conducted in 1856 at the age of 64 and 65 um, and writing it up for a paper for Philosophical Transactions, which was made into the uh, Beckerian Lecture, was published uh, the following year in, in 1857, and was his last paper to be published uh, by the Royal Society. And it's remarkable that uh, some of his samples, nearly 160 years old, are still now here today with us. That's right, the, uh, the RI has, a, has always had a tendency not to throw things out, so we've still got uh, about half a dozen of Faraday's colloidal solutions uh, that he made in 1856. Okay, so um, that bottle of the Michael Faraday um, was made um, in 1856, so oh, now 160 years old. Um, it's in there available. So what he did was this, this is I uh, wrote to Tim Holt in Royal Society because I edited to um, Tim Issue for Royal Society. So he was really helpful and um, saving me looking for the PDF. He sent me the PDF again and spent the whole day reading the Michael Friday article again. And for me, this is really beautiful. What, what, what is the first thing when you're going to say here that it's a solution weak and the phosphorus is clean part of the gold is reduced in the exceeding fine particle and then it produces a beautiful ruby fluid. And I felt like it's a little like you're reading a poetic instead of a scientific paper. It's really, really beautiful. But in those days, what he did is he, he lost a um, sunfire, um, they call it like sunfire of carbon and phosphorus. And as we know, they are quite toxic. So today, uh, we're going to have uh, some demonstration of making the gold nanoparticle and we use some lighter reductant. So that is, uh, we're going to use some um, citrate. So that is, you can see abundantly in our lemon. Um, so you can see them. And so uh, we're going to make the synthesis of the gold nanoparticle using the lemon juice. 
So the challenge is that you can see that it can be simply um, done um, by very quick demonstration like that. But then uh, the lemon juice um, Lilin bot is either from Sembury or Tesco. And uh, each of the time, they may be slightly different. So she spent two days to spend uh, to make sure that you know the the, the reaction is work um, as quickly as possible. And uh, so now you're going to see that she adding some gold salt, uh, which is and then later on she adds some um, lemon juice. In um, how do I going to switch that? Uh, So you can see that um, with time, yeah, um, a little bit of time, you will see that uh, the color going to change, as you can see from the slide. And later on, we want to see that how we're going to um, make the nanoparticle quick side, we had to do the TM. And that is a nanoparticle uh, you're going to see um, with the TM. So you will have to see that um, going back to the slide. Yeah, so we had to see that you know, this is a, a small particle that you're going to uh, measure them in the TM. But um, we can also make the nanoparticle of the different sizes, and then because of the light uh, diffracted, uh, absorbed, uh, absorbed or transmitted, it will have a different color of light. But then uh, what happened is that we now can use the UV, um, UV vis measurement. So it's very simple with the ocean optic with very small device, you can see the optical change that you can determine the size of the nanoparticle. So what it is that uh, you're going to have the absorption at the maximum and divide it at the absorption at 450 and then use uh, this um, ratio and you can determine the size of the nanoparticle. So it's very simply you can determine the size of, of the nanoparticle and uh, if you can see now that the colors that already change um, now, it very quickly you can change. So um, you can see that hopefully it's a beautiful ruby fluid that you can see there so that we can make the gold nanoparticle very quickly uh, using the gold salt um, with the lemon juice. So then uh, you need to determine the concentration of the gold nanoparticle. So one, you know the size of the nanoparticle using the previous table and then you're going to determine the extinction coefficient and then using this table and then you can use a simple equation that absorption at 250 and then divide by that extinction coefficient then you can calculate the concentration of the gold nanoparticle. So uh, what is the application of the gold nanoparticle? One of the very simple um, effect is just the irrigation assays and it's an immunoassay. So what I'm uh, Fundamentally, that when go nanoparticle, they are very well dispersed. You will see the uh, very distinctive um, absorption at the 520 nanometer. And when they aggregate, light is electromagnetic wave interact with electrons around the nanoparticle when they are very se well separated apart, or when the aggregate are different. So then you will have a change in absorption at the longer wavelength, and this called the color change from the red to blue. So, uh, so what is the immunoassay? The immunoassay is the interaction between the antibody and antigen. So antibody is a molecule with two binding sites. So antigen can be antibody. So that in this case, you have a protein um, A coating around the gold nanoparticle. And then if you're adding the antibody in. So antibody is going to buy with protein A, which is antigen, and you're going to have this immunoassay of antibody antigen. And then what you do is that this antibody bring two nanoparticles close together. If you have a lot of them, you can bring a lot more of the gold nanoparticle and you cause this aggregation effect. And then you're going to change the color from the red to blue. So that is something very basic. So I'm going to have a little quiz to the audience. So um, here's... Um, Francisco Rossi going to have a four bottle of the gold uh, nanoparticle and they look on really red, like beautiful ruby fluid, like Michael Faraday described it. So then one, um, he, all of them is a red, so they believe you. Mm -hmm. And then what you're what you going to do is that 
Um, the first one, he going to eat a little bit, like you can see, so bottled there. So he a little bit of the brine solution in. And what do you think that the color going to happen? Any color? And you can say yellow, blue, red. Okay, come on, say do it. And you can see now the color going to change from red to blue. So instantly, very quickly, you're going to see the color change. So now it's beautiful purple already, I can see. Right? So, so then the next thing, the next thing is that now he's going to add some gold nanoparticle in and with the um, egg white. And yeah, so that the act. So you're going to add some egg white into some of the gold nanoparticle. So we only have a control. So, <laughs> so we <laughs> have a one um, one uh, bottle with um, gold nanoparticle with egg white, and also another bottle of gold nanoparticle with egg white. But now he's going to add the bright into one of those bottles. What do you think? What color is going to turn into? What color, Josh? <laughs> what color? Yeah, okay, yeah, it's going to stay red, yes. Yeah, okay. So that, 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 is, a, that is a demonstration, so I go back to the laptop. Um, so um, at the end of the irrigation assay, and I, I love this beautiful picture here, and it's irrigate of this um, irrigation assay of this one chain, uh, the color from red to, uh, to purple blue. And you can see that some of them are really, really beautiful um, purple as well. So when they irrigate and you look under the TM, if you zoom in, you see that kind of normal TM, but you start kind of zooming out and see, and it's what beautiful. So I got the red daisy of gold nanoparticle. So fundamentally, um, okay, so, uh, as you're guessing why uh, something of red and blue is a fundamental in terms of the stabilization of the nanoparticle. So we have a two uh, mechanism. One is a steric stabilization. So that means when you have here is a peptide of amino acid and we have an egg white, which is protein, which is much longer. So that they provide the steric stabilization. And at the same time, uh, sometimes if a citrate is negatively charged, so you have uh, electrostatic stabilization so that they expel each other. So go nanoparticles are really um, separate apart. They don't come together, so they don't aggregate. The moment you're adding salt into the citrate nanoparticle, you're screening the charge, and there is no charge repunction anymore. So that's why the color change from red to blue. But then if you add the egg white, you add this buffer layer of the steric stabilization, then you're adding the salt in, it doesn't got that effect. So um, that, that is very basic uh, when you do the stabilization of um, the nanoparticle. And again, we're using the uh, calorimetric assay to identify which protein or which antibody or which um, peptide or polymer to stabilize based on very simple effect of the color change. So then we can also use the site exclusion chromatography to separate them. So you can separate, uh, separate the pure gold nanoparticle without excess of peptide or the citrate, and that now gold nanoparticle are stable like instant coffee. So you can keep them for years and disperse them in water again. So one of the things that because they got the peptides surrounding the gold nanoparticles, they behave like a protein-like. So when you do gel electrophoresis, you can do this uh, protein or uh, a peptide-coated gold nanoparticle. They act like a, a protein. So what the most recent work, what you work is just the uh, gold nano rod. So as you can see from uh, the TM here, that they are very homogeneous in shape. So all of them um, have a, a rod shape. But remarkable that you can fine tune the aspect ratio. So um, 
At the longer uh, near infrared, they absorb light very strongly there. And there's one of the applications that you can use a laser light and you can heat up the gold nano rod and you can kill the cancer cell locally. Like in the video, we're talking about magnetic hyperthermia uh, cancer treatment, but you can you also use a laser light to heat up the nano rod for the cancer treatment. So one of the applications we use with the gold nano rod is that we use it for sensing. So we can sense it's many different things, but I just give you the principle of that. So when we make a gold nano rod, it got a positively charged because we make in the molecule C top. And DNA, as you know, with the phosphate backbone, get negatively charged. So when you put the negative to positive, you neutralize. And you can see that what happened there, there is no repunction. Then it's going to be aggregate. So that what you see that they, they aggregate and you can see that long absorption and the longer wavelength, the same what you see in the spectrum I showed you before with the gold nanoparticle. But you keep adding the DNA in because it's negatively charged, it now go to the neutral point and it become negative. So the system become more stable. And then so at higher concentration of DNA, you actually have a less signal. So that's why we call it inverse sensing. So with lower signal, we can do it uh, even better. And then using the same technique, you can uh, detect the actual uh, cellular DNA in the environment. Uh, so one of the new it works, what you use, and I said in the abstract, so that I had to put in this slide that we use a go nano rod, and so also go nano star, and we go uh, to you with a photo uh, sensi uh, sensitizer dye, and then you can kill the bacteria on the film. And this is very uh, similar in mechanism, which is like uh, Professor Ivan Parking have been using with the small go nano particle, and he got on the different production uh, using for the hospital. Uh, to kill bacteria on the hospital. So again, like with gold nanoparticle, um, okay, I show you the demonstration that they can kill the bacteria in hospital. You can do the irrigation assay for the sensing. So this is only the last few days. Uh, you look in just the clinical trial, uh, .org, and you put uh, the go nanoparticle in the search and you found the five of the about 12. So some of them are completed studies, some of them are recruiting, some of them are not uh, finishing. So I just give you an example of what the go nanoparticle, this is not my work, but you can see there that they are now recruiting. So if you are interested, you can be a volunteer and then it's a phase one, and the condition is a type one diabetes. And then what they study is that they use gold nanoparticle here as a drug. And they can, you can see that the solution for injection. So it's a reality that you know, the gold nanoparticle can got into the human for the try. So now I'm going to switch into the second part is a magnetic a nanoparticle, and so this one, uh, if you go down to the basement, you will find this ring coil um, apparated. So what interesting thing is about uh, the magnetic field when you're going to use inside the human is that um, what happened if I'm going to pour this uh, beaker of the uh, paper clip, it's going to be falling down, but if you're going to see if I got the magnet and it's not going to falling down at all. But remarkable is that also the magnetic field is also have an effect with the long distance so that when you have a magnetic nanoparticle inside the human and you have an apparatus just got an alternating magnetic field, it can penetrate through your body and heat it up the nanoparticle as you can see. So you see some of the flyer, then if you don't believe me, then you know that there is a whole field of the whole community of researcher working with magnetic nanoparticle for the various applications. So some of the flyer, you will see more detail about of some, of the, um, some of the work. So again, looking in that uh, database of the clinical trial, and so this is the most recent, what I found that uh, completed. It's, it's only June uh, 2017. So what they do is that um, ferromoxitol is as a drug, it's already FDA approved, but they use it for different application. So they use as a nanoparticle MRI, so they need to go through the clinical trial again. <clears throat> so um, it's remarkable that Mark Foss in Germany, they attracted 35 million investment from uh, European Investment Bank. And what you can see here that, that the magnetic hyperthermia is not going to replace the traditional cancer therapy, but actually it's going to be, have a synergistic effect with the 
um, as a method. So they, you can see that I underline here that it's additional for chemo and the radiotherapy. So, okay, so then this one, they have a fine machine and they try to go in to uh, kill the patient, but each of the treatment, it costs 40,000 euro. So what can we do? So uh, in our research, we try to find some kind of better nanoparticle, which is hitting better. So we try to make a pure iron nanoparticle, but the problem is that the pure iron nanoparticle got oxidized very easily. So as they say that Michael Friday uh, sample, that 163 is all cysteine stable because its goal is inert, but you don't find this um, iron oxide nanoparticle very stable. So here I'm just going to show you the video of the iron fire work. Um, yeah, it should, it should come. Yeah. So the thing is that what I want is that I want to iron zero. So that means that um, they are not iron two or iron three. So then when you have this iron nanoparticle, they get oxidized very easily and burst into the flame instantly. So. Um, so we, we design different type of nanoparticles. So we, as I said before, that we make them that have a pure um, iron zero core. So what we need to do is that uh, we need to have a coating so that to protect it from contacting with the oxygen. So the iron cobalt is one of the class alloy which have a highest magnetic moment. So we managed to make that and coating with the platinum and also later on uh, functionalize that with the polymer to make them water dispersible to improve the current treatment of hypothermia cancer treatment. So the most uh, recent work is just recently I got the page number out uh, for us to making this nanoparticle. So as you can see that my aim is to make pure iron but is when have a little bit of the coating uh, of iron oxide. So I know it's a lunch hour lecture, but there is some uh, specialized people in the audience, so I just show it how we make the nanoparticle. We make them in hot organic solvent, and we're adding as a precursor at the different concentration. So as you can see here, that if you have a higher concentration and a higher amount, that means you're adding um, more, then it's going through the process of seed-mediated growth. And then we're going to get the particle getting bigger, bigger, and bigger. And why is that? Because if you got oxidation, they consi con consistently have uh, the same thickness. So if you get a bigger, then you can save a little bit of the core. And the bit of that core is a high, highly, magnet highly magnetic moment of iron nanoparticle. And you can uh, follow that um, through that, uh, the characterization of the scanning um, electron a microscope and you can see that it clearly they have a core shell structure. And now you can see that our particle here and compared with all the commercially available nanoparticle, we got the highest um, magnetic heating. So the iron P is a intrinsic loss parameter. And then also we're now protecting particle for two months and they are still stable. So some of the application of the magnetic nanoparticle is at the ex vivo or in vitro application. So I want to move in one of very quick application is that, for example, that uh, we have a lot of infectious disease uh, in developing country or even in here. And then uh, what you can do that if you make the particle coating, as I said to you, with um, antibody interaction. So if you're coating with protein A and antibody, interact, the FC fragment, like in the letter, it is around here into the surface of the magnetic nanoparticle. And then when you have uh, the outbreak, then you identify that antibody that's specific to that pathogen, and then put into your nanoparticle, and then you put into the solution, and here the cholera, then you can pull the bacteria out. So using the magnetic, like you see the magnet here, you can um, separate the pathogen, but you can also concentrate the pathogen as well. So the in vivo application, as I said before, that the magnetic hypothermia, so I just give you that our effort into the field. So we use a thermoresponsive polymer. So the polymer will be responded to the heat. At the high temperature, it is passed in 
hard organic solvent, like I said in previous slide, that what we do the synthesis in hard organic solvent. And then uh, when you make the um, solution cooling down, they change the conformation and become hydrophilic. So you remove all the hard organic solvent and you put the water in, then the particles are dispersed into the water. So then what we want to use is that now we're going to encapsulate the drug inside the magnetic nanoparticle. And remember the slide I show you with the European Investment Bank, they invest in the MAGFOS, but in the combination with the chemotherapy. So we want to combine the chemotherapy here, that's a drug. When you heat the magnetic nanoparticle, the polymer will also heat and release a drug. And then here, we design the system that they also sensitive to the pH because in the cancer cell, it's more acidic. So as I show you two curves, the first curve at the higher pH 7.5, at lower temperature 25, the drug release is not so high, but you now go into the black curve on top at the acidic environment and also at high temperature, you got more drug release. So in collaboration with colleague in Kings, uh, we can also use a magnetic nanoparticle for MRI imaging. So uh, we use a different kind of um, um, encapsulation and we can put into the pancreatic eye list and then we can grab them into the kidney and clearly you can see that the MRI signal seven day and, um, compared to the control. So fundamentally, it's very important uh, before, when you, when you make the nanoparticle, then uh, that you will say, what nanoparticle will make 10, 15 nanometer? But now there is much more sophisticated because they come aggregate together or form the cluster. You can see already the effect of the gold nanoparticle that change the color, but also the magnetic effect. You have a magnetic anisotropy and also the magnetic dipole dipole interaction. So the interaction of within the particle will giving you different heating efficiency. So if you can exploit this phenomenon, then you can have a better heating nanoparticle compared with the traditional standard dispersed nanoparticle. So here, just give you an example that if you have uh, this uh, cluster with a bigger uh, core compared with a bigger cluster with smaller core, the heating are different. Okay. So the uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, Professor um, uh, Asterios, um Gabrielidis in uh, chemical engineering, we use a microfluidic approach. Okay, you can see here that, uh, but I can give you all the ingredient and everything else, and you're going to repeat the experiment. It might not really come into the red, ruby, beautiful color. It might aggregate. Okay, so there is a lot of thing to control. So now if you're going to use a microfluidic, you can control that the flow rate, the addition, the order of the addition, the resident time, and the mixing time, so then you can have a more control of the synthesis of nanoparticles. So you have a more robust system and also the scaling up. So it's a more uh, recent paper we uh, show that with some classical uh, synthesis of the gold nanoparticle after Michael Friday, uh, we also have a Dukovic in uh, 1950, the very classical synthesis paper. But even then, that now using the microfluidic, we can see that the mass transfer, that how we're going to stir the reaction fast or slow, will determine the monodispersity of the nanoparticle. So if you have a fast stirring or slow stirring, you have a different quality of the nanoparticle. So I just give you some a flavor of some of the work. So as a, here, it's a um, it's snapshot of the group. And here, if you can go down to the basement of your institution and place and find out 10 elements that discovered there. And we're, we were very privileged. We used to have this um, office desk. Um, office, we don't have that anymore, sadly. But uh, we had this table from um, Bragg family for us using as a lunchtime lecture. So I would like to acknowledge all my collaborators. It's very international efforts, but also very interdisciplinary effort. And also I would like to thank all the funders, first of all, the Royal Society to fund for my um, a fellowship, uh, BBSC for my first grant, EPSRC for our two recent grant, and all other people. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to answer your questions.
Um, thank you very much, uh, Than, for a really excellent lecture covering a whole range of different nanomaterials. Um, so we've got time for a few questions. And if you have a question, can you put your hand up and then we'll give you a microphone and then don't start speaking until you've got the microphone. So does anyone, I've got lots, but I, I see Than on a regular basis. But has anyone got a question they would like to ask? Thank you. Uh, how does gold chloride enhance, reduce silver staining of no fibers and also diaminobenzidine in immunohistology? So uh, that's antigen antibody binding. Uh, how, does it, how does it manage to work? Where are the charges? Okay, so you're talking about that the gold chloride? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. chlorouric acid, yeah, gold chloride. Yes, and then to do something with the silver? Well, uh, um, how does it enhance the reduce silver staining in nerve fibers, and also the diamine or benzidine, which is a, a brown dye, how does it strengthen that? Um, I did not do, do that study myself, so I will have to read it in more detail to, to answer you. Is that, is that okay that I will answer you that question later? I, yeah. I, I, I'll, I'll look it up then. Uh, no, I will talk to you a little bit later. Thank you. With your, um, your rod-shaped nanoparticles, do you exploit any of the anisotropy in the rod shape? What's the difference between the rod shape and the, and the I guess, spherical particles? Or? Uh, yes, so basically that you, you, if you have a cervical roughly like that, so the like interaction in all direction would be the same. Um, so you will have only one uh, peak at 520, that the very uh, classical or uh, characteristic peak so now if you have a rod, the light interact into that direction, horizontal, even with that. So you can see now the dampen at 520, you say very, very little peak, but you get very strong peak at the longer wavelength. Um, so then it's shifting the peak to the near infrared and it absorbs very strongly there. So then people using, uh, using the laser and absorb um, the laser light in that near infrared to heat the gold nano rod, and that for the hyperthermia laser cancer treatment. Um, for cancer treatment with iron nanoparticles, um, in the video it said that it fills up the space between the tumor cells and. Uh, but how do you make sure that the liquid doesn't fill the space between the healthy cells? And so when you expose them to magnetic field and when they start uh, oscillating, how do we make sure that uh, healthy cells are not affected? Yeah, I think that, that that is a very good question. And I think that we all have to take care of that when, when it happens. So that means you have to control the dose. And also not only the dose at the concentration of the particle, it's more importantly is a heat dose. So that means what type of nanoparticle, what the size, what the chemical composition, and also more complicatedly is that you have to uh, use an alternating magnetic field. So different field and different frequency, you will have a different heat dose. So then how are you going to make sure that the heat dose that going only contain within the cancer cell and not into the normal cell? And you know, spilling over of the nanoparticle is that something we also need to look into it as well. continuation of the cancer treatment. So do you think there's any particular side effects you want to watch out when you are using the nanopart magnetic nanoparticles? So um, iron oxide is FDA approved. One of the reasons is FDA approved because it hemoglobin contain a lot of iron. And ferritin also contain a lot of iron. So the iron will go into body and go into metabolize, so in go into the blood pool normally. So normally you have a very little side effect with the iron oxide nanoparticle. But as you're going to talking about like this gold nano rod, if you look into that, you know, they haven't uh, got any clinical trial, but when they look into that, they will have to see that if any uh, side effect is going to happen. But remember that with glioblastoma, the patient can only live three to maximum six months. 
So anything that the family are desperate to hang on to their loved one for a few more months. So then the side effect there, it is a different equation. So if you're going to treat the cancer of the 20 years old, obviously you have to take care of this side effect. So everything we had to put into the balance. So we develop the new technology to complement with the existing technology and enhance the life of many different people and own work of life. Um, so, MacFoss is available for treatment if you have a 40,000 euro per treatment. So, yes, it is available. Uh, yes, that's the whole point that I'm, I'm here doing the research that we are going to, going to reduce the cost of the nanoparticle because it's so, so expensive at the moment. So thanks very much. Uh, th I'm just going back to your question about the cost. Um, actually, when you make it in the lab, it's about 2p. Um, and you can get li literally liters, it's about as cheap as you can get. But by the time you go all the way through the medical processes and getting to approval, each stage adds an additional cost. And so um, that's just one thing to bear in mind. So I'd like to thank everyone for coming along today and also thank, uh, in particular, um, not only Than, but also her very able assistant. She's very brave to do demonstrations. So, joining me is yes, to thank uh, Francisco, Rossi, Lilin, um, and um, we have more. Uh, Elizabeth and um, George was helping by the laser without the battery. Yeah. So, so if you just join uh, me in thanking all of them for a really excellent presentation. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much. Thank you.